station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. LBJ Library, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is LBJ Library in Austin, Texas. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. How do you hear us? We hear you wonderfully. Thank you so much. All right, I have our first student here to ask your first question. Uh, what are you doing during the year-long mission in the International Space Station? Well, you know, we do a lot up here. We have uh, about 400 different uh, scientific experiments throughout the time that, that Misha and I are here, and those are in all different types of uh, scientific disciplines. We also do maintenance on the space station, and we uh, do certain activities to improve it. We're doing, uh, uh, Chet Lindgren, uh, one of the other astronauts, and I are doing a spacewalk next week to do that. But the stuff that's specific to this flight, the one-year flight, it has to do with understanding, you know, how our physiology uh, changes throughout a, uh, you know, a longer time in space and how we are going to, uh, you know, prevent those changes, understand them so we can go on to Mars someday or elsewhere. Can you tell us more about the Russian Soyuz? Well, the Russian Soyuz vehicle is a very reliable uh, spacecraft that has been flying for over 50 years. It is our rescue vehicle, and at the same time, it's um, our vehicle that flies us uh, to the station. We like this vehicle very much, and I hope our colleagues like it as well. So far, it is the only vehicle uh, flying to the station and a rescue vehicle that we're using. It is um, a vehicle that has been upgraded. It's not the same that has been flying uh, 20 years ago. And I would like to emphasize again, it is a very reliable vehicle. Thank you. This is a question for Scott. What makes your year-long mission different from a regular mission? Well, you know, there's the obvious things. And, you know, I, it's part of the question. Uh, you know, it's much longer. But that also means it's, uh, you know, it's harder in, uh, you know, that you're isolated, uh, you know, for a longer period of time. I think it's, you know, it's twice as long. I think it's more than twice as hard, though. Um, and what comes with that, that, that duration, is extra training. Um, you know, we're going to do more activities while we're up here. We're going to do more science. We're going to do... Uh, you know, have a larger variety of, of types of uh, things we need to be responsible and accomplish. So the training is uh, more difficult. We're here with, uh, Misha and I are here with, uh, you know, 12, actually I'll be here with 13 other crew members, including uh, Misha. And uh, so, you know, we just have to get, uh, you know, comfortable working with uh, different people. And uh, it just makes for a, uh, you know, a more complicated, but at the same time, a, a more re rewarding experience. Question from Mikhail. What does the launch feel like? Well, launch is a, a very impressive event. Uh, it was my second launch. I have um, more experience than most, but it's always an unforgettable, very exciting experience, but also it's a, uh, an activity at work that uh, requires a lot of responsibility. Um, these are the most uh, important stages of the flight in space exploration, the entire uh, mission uh, accomplishment and success depends on that uh, stage. Thank you. This is 
surprise question from, for Scott from Mark, your brother. With so much conflict around the world involving energy, what, if anything, is being done on the ISS to solve the global energy problem? Well, that's a good question. I didn't know I was going to get questions from my brother. Um, this facility um, and this orbiting laboratory is a, uh, you know, a very uh, energy efficient uh, environment. We use solar energy. Uh, it's been powering our human presence here for the last 15 years. We've had people living here completely on, on solar energy. Um, we recycle um, our water. We basically take our urine and turn it into water and uh, we can drink that. And uh, you know, from that water, we also, uh, through a process of electrolysis, we make oxygen. Um, we scrub our atmosphere of carbon dioxide, and uh, you know, which is which is CO2. And uh, you know, from the oxygen uh, we get out of that CO2, and the uh, the hydrogen we get out of making electricity out of our water, we also can make more water. So it's uh, kind of this closed loop environmental control system and uh, energy system, I guess you could say, that really just uses the sun um, to, to make it all happen. And, uh, you know, it's a state-of-the-art system. It allows us to, I think, understand how we can, uh, you know, use uh, renewable energy in a much uh, more complete way. Um, we also do other kinds of scientific experiments. For instance, we're standing right near, next to this uh, combustion integrated rack, which is this very, you can't see it because the door is closed, but it's a very complicated uh, furnace, scientific furnace that allows us to uh, do experiments to understand uh, the process of combustion better and how to make more fuel efficient, uh, uh, you know, combustion uh, reactions. Um, we also have this uh, Japanese experiment going on now called plant gravity sensing. It's a follow-on to a previous experiment, but it's the idea is if we understand how uh, plants, um, you know, how how they their genetics are such that they go towards gravity versus water. Um, if you could genetically engineer a plant that would be more prone for the roots to to travel towards water, you could use theoretically use less water to uh, to grow them and you know water is also a uh, you know national security issue or will be for for some countries so uh, you know understanding those kind of processes the, the uh, renewable energy uh, how to better use water to grow our food is uh, you know very important for you know the the planet uh, down below that we're looking at right through our window down there thank you Scott What can you see from the space station? <laughs> it depends uh, which one place we are flying off, uh, flying from. Uh, for example, now I see uh, Pacific Ocean, <laughs> if I don't mind, uh, and in. In several minutes, we will fly in, uh, under the India. South America. South America, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and uh, all circle around the Earth, it's 90 minutes, and we can observe uh, practically 90% um, of, of Earth. It's very impressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to just add to that, I think maybe what you're getting at is maybe what uh, what can you see that is, uh, you know, made by by people. And, uh, you know, there's this common mis misconception that we can see the uh, Great Wall of China, for instance. Um, but you, you can't because it's not that large, but also because it's generally made with the materials that are surrounding it. So it's somewhat camouflaged. But we could see airports uh, stand out. Um, you could see fields that are, you know, for, for uh, you know, farmers' fields that are in certain shapes. 
Um, you can definitely see cities, especially at night, but you can see cities and tell that that's something that is uh, man-made. The other thing that's really easy to see that is uh, as a result of, you know, human, um, you know, our life on Earth is pollution. You can definitely tell that there's certain areas of the world that are uh, much more polluted than others because you generally don't see, uh, see those cities and see, uh, see the ground very well. All right, I have two questions. Uh, my first one is, how long do you have to train? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think generally for a long duration space flight, we train from, uh, you know, two to three years. But, uh, you know, that's after you're already a, uh, an astronaut and, or cosmonaut and have been, um, you know, training, um, you know, since you started there, which is usually the basic training. I think for both of our programs is on the order of, you know, two to three years. And uh, so from the time, you know, you get selected as an astronaut, probably the minimum, minimum amount of time you would wind up training these days is from, you know, five to six years for a... Uh, for a flight, but you know this, uh, you know this facility is so complicated. The work we do here, uh, you know, is tough in a lot of ways. That, you know, I think there are skills that I learned in, uh, you know, as, when I was your age that are, you know, serving me well up here. So I look at it as more of a, a lifelong, you know, training process to get here versus, you know, any particular shorter period of time. Uh, this one for Scott. Uh, what effects does the space flight have on your body? Yeah, there's a bunch of effects from uh, living in microgravity. Um, you know, some of them, those are well known, like the, uh, you know, loss of bone mass and uh, muscle mass. Um, and we have ways to, to mitigate those, to make them less like uh, exercise and and diet. Uh, there's also a recent thing we've discovered a few years ago is effect uh, effects on the, the structure of our our eyes and uh, optic nerve and and uh, an impact on our, our, our vision. And uh, you know, understanding that and uh, knowing how to prevent that is going to be important for you know any future trip to trips to Mars. We also have the effects of radiation, um, which you know, can affect us, uh, you know, in varying ways, and some of those ways you may never even find out. But we do get we do get a, a pretty healthy dose of radiation up here, and that's uh, you know that's kind of a negative effect. The uh, there's also an effect on our immune system. Our immune system is somewhat uh, degraded while we're in space, um, but there are a lot of positive effects of of living up here. Um, you know, you get a unique uh, perspective on our planet that is, uh, is uh, you know, really hard to, to describe sometimes. But, uh, you know, seeing the Earth down there and understanding that all the people, you know, that we, you know, know and love and things we care about are all right, right down there. And, uh, you know, see how, you know, the Earth looks more like, you know, uh, one country than just a bunch of different countries. It looks like we're kind of all in this situation down there together um, and then you you know the other positive thing is you get to work on something that we, we think is very important you know something we feel very strongly about and uh, and uh, you know work with a great group of people for Mikhail what do cosmonauts do when they're not in space скажите что делают космонавты когда они не на не летают в космосе Ну, есть такое понятие, как э, период после полета. Uh, there is such a time uh, stage that post, that includes post-flight rehabilitation. We're going to have a year of rehabilitation. Scott and myself, after our long uh, duration mission, um, then we're going to have the medical examination um, that will clear us for subsequent uh, training 
then you uh, are assigned a new flight, and then you're going to go through a two and a half or three year long training for the next flight. That is uh, a brief description. Thank you. This is a question for Scott. What kind of food do you eat? Yeah, so we have uh, you know, we have all different kinds of food. Most of it is uh, this uh, food that's called irradiated. Um, so it's uh, hit with some radiation to kill any bacteria or germs it might have. Those are kind of like you know military style, uh, what are called MREs or meals ready to eat. You know, food in a bag. Um, and then we have I don't know if we have any around here, but we have some. Uh, uh, rehydratable food. It's kind of like camping food that you add water to. Uh, uh, it's expensive to fly stuff to orbit, so if you can, you know, launch food that doesn't have the weight of the water and, the, you know, the volume that that then takes up, it's uh, more cost effective. And it's, you know, stays uh, fresh longer, so we have a lot of rehydratable food. We have some food that's uh, you know, you can buy in the grocery store stuff that is what we call off the shelf. And, uh, you know, that our people that manage our food system, like a, you know, package of tuna fish, for instance, things like that. Cosmonauts food's different. We share a lot of the stuff. A lot of their stuff comes in cans, um, but it's good. And it's uh, great to have a, a variety of things to eat up here. Mikhail, uh, what do you do for fun and do you get to watch TV? Well, you've practically answered the question. Um, we do watch TV. Uh, there is a TV channel here, but it uh, has a short band. And uh, we also have a library. We can watch movies. We can read books. We can call uh, over the regular phone uh, to talk to our friends and family. We have uh, internet access on Saturdays and Sundays. We have video conferences with families, so it is a variety of um, psychological support that is available to the crew, and it is very good. It does help us a lot during our flight. So this is a question for Scott. Are you able to contact your family or use any kind of, like, websites for email? Yeah, like, uh, you know, Misha was just saying, we have um, the ability to communicate with friends and family via via a, a telephone. Um, it's kind of like a Skype-type uh, capability, voice over IP is how it's generally referred to. So, you know, a call over the Internet. Um, probably about 50 minutes out of every hour we have enough coverage to do that. Uh, we have the ability to do a video conference, obviously, like what we're doing here right now. So we can do that with our our families uh, generally once a week. Uh, we have email, and uh, we also have the capability to get on the Internet and, uh, you know, on different websites. Although it's somewhat slow, it's still uh, better than nothing. So I mean, we have a lot, of, a lot of capability to stay in contact with people on the ground. This from Raquel, what is the most daunting aspect of exploration? All right. Heard that that's our last question. Right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Well, it was, uh, it was our pleasure, and uh, thanks for all the great questions. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. And thank you, LBJ Library. Station, we are now resuming operational audio comm.